for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. They did not know when they woke up that morning at 8 a.m. ready to go uh, travel and look at humanitarian project. They did not wake up thinking that they would be dead that day. And many Congolese every day don't wake up thinking that they would be dead. But they are being killed because in the DRC, there is so much wealth needed for modern day technology that as long as there is death in the DRC, we will continue um, to have resources pilfered out of the DRC at a very low cost. And the Congolese people will not benefit from the wealth. <music>
they name the perpetrator of that violence. Uh, they, they say that the people who committed this crime were the FDLR rebel group, an acronym. Uh, but this, this rebel group is connected uh, to Rwanda. Uh, those are uh, Rwandan soldiers and those who, uh, some of whom committed the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 and have been in the DRC since 1994. Um, they group today through all the information that exists pub uh, widely available publicly is around 120 to about 400 uh, rebels. Uh, this 120 to 400 rebels are not being able to be stopped, neither by the United Nations, which has the largest peacekeeping mission in the world with over 20,000 soldiers in uh, the DRC, neither by the Congolese army and neither by the invasions of the DRC by its neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, because Rwanda has been in Congo and Uganda have been in the Congo. So why aren't they stopping them? I think um, one is lack of political will, but for the situation why I'm bringing that up is to show uh, the confusion even in the Congolese government around the situation, because after they put out this statement, 48 hours after putting out the statement, the Congolese government retracted the statement. They state now that the, uh, the person who signed the press release with the information that the FDLR are the one responsible for the, this heinous crime uh, were not authorized to make this such statement. And this is not the position of the Congolese uh, government. But this is also uh, the situation of the, these deaths. It's not the first time people are dying in Congo. Even after that date, on the February 23rd, and even yesterday on February 24th, over 17 Congolese have been killed in the same area. It's not in international press, in local press it exists. Seven, 17 Congolese have died. Unfortunately, we may hear also today more of that in the same region, that the people in the region of North Kivu and South Kivu are living in constant fear for their life. You leave the house, you can be killed any day, any time. And why are they being killed? The people live on the land that has resources, mineral resources, and also a land that's uh, fertile. So people are being systematically killed to create fear in the community and being displaced. And these killings are happening in front of the Congolese military, in front of the United Nations, and nothing is stopping the killing. But now, with the uh, death of uh, Luca Atanasio, there is a discussion globally around what's happening in the Congo. But for me, I'm not that hopeful. I'm much more, uh, I'm a bit pessimistic about the, what will happen after the investigation, but I'm much more cautious. Because two years ago, about not uh, two years ago, in 2017, uh, two UN group of experts were killed in the DRC. Uh, in a region called Kasai. One was American and the other was Swedish uh, Chilean, Zaida Catalan and um, Michael Schopp. Michael Schopp was the American and Chilean was Zaida Catalan. They were killed. The, the video also was leaked of how they were killed. Um, they were shot and uh, Zaida unfortunately was beheaded. Through the investigation, it was found that there was some form of pressure to hide evidence of the investigation. Up until today, there is nothing actually moving forward. When a UN group of experts from the United Nations were killed in DRC, nothing unfolded. And uh, foreign policy published a report showing that the United Nations was suppressing evidence of the killing of these two UN experts uh, maybe do, according to foreign policy, uh, to the implication of the Congolese government into the killing. So today, seeing the killing of an Italian diplomat, I'm much more cautious to say because a European was killed in Congo, maybe now the world will pay attention. The stakes are very high. Uh, the answer to the crisis in the, the Congo, I often say, is found at the UN Security Council. Two of the members of the UN Security Council, the United States and the United Kingdom. Why I always point fingers at these two nations? Because they are allies to Rwanda and Uganda, two nations that invaded the Congo twice. The Congo as a country sued both 
Rwanda and Uganda at the International Court of Justice. The case of Rwanda was rejected at the court. The case of Uganda, Congo won this case. The International Court of Justice found Uganda guilty of war crimes in the DRC and demanded that Uganda pay $10 billion of reparation for the crimes that Uganda committed in the DRC. The reason why the Rwandan case was rejected is simply because Rwanda has never signed the Rome Treaty. So the ICJ does not have jurisdiction in uh, Rwanda or in uh, stating that Rwanda is guilty for war crimes in DRC. There is another country that's similar to Rwanda, that would be the United States. The United States has never signed the Rome Treaty. This is why they do not want their soldiers uh, who committed crimes in Afghanistan or elsewhere to be tried for war crimes that committed uh, outside of the United States. So bringing that up is to create the backdrop to the killing of these three individuals. They did not know when they woke up that morning at 8 a.m. ready to go uh, travel and look at humanitarian project. They did not wake up thinking that they would be dead that day. And many Congolese every day don't wake up thinking that they would be dead. But they are being killed because in the DRC, there is so much wealth needed for modern day technology that as long as there is death in the DRC, we will continue um, to have resources pilfered out of the DRC at a very low cost, and the Congolese people will not benefit from the wealth. Despite the tensions between the DRC and its neighbors, the current government led by Felix Shisakedi has been getting closer to Rwanda. On multiple occasions, Shisakedi has attended events in Rwanda. In March 2019, Shisakedi paid tribute at a genocide memorial in Rwanda at the sidelines of an economic forum. This drew sharp criticism in the DRC because of Rwanda's role in the unrest and violence in the country. Congolese people also expressed anger at the fact that Shisakedi had never paid tribute to the millions of Congolese who have died during the country's bloody history of wars and occupation. It has been a shock to Congolese to see the close rapprochement of the Congolese president uh, to Rwanda, mainly because of the crimes that Rwanda has committed there. Uh, we saw the Congolese president go to Kigali and visit the genocide memorial and bow uh, for the millions of uh, Rwandans who died uh, during the genocide. It's a surprise to us because he's never done such a thing for the millions who have died in the RC. Uh, we saw him very close to uh, President Kagame having declarations together for peace and stability, but no question of, for example, Rwandan General James Kabarebe who is wanted in the DRC for crimes that he committed. Now, this is a random official. Uh, the reason why I'm always mentioning uh, James Kabarebe is very important for viewers to know this. James Kabarebe is a random soldier who in 1997 became the Congolese army chief of staff. And after the conflict between Rwanda and Uganda unfolded, he was kicked out of the Congo and went back to Rwanda. Why am I mentioning that? Because when he was the Congolese Army Chief of Staff in 1997, he told us Congolese that he was Congolese. Today we're surprised he's a Rwandan general in Rwanda in military function. So when people usually try to find that, is, really is it really true that Rwanda is in DRC? I saw the numerous reports and evidence that exist. I always use that example of having a general, uh, as I call it, a criminal with our border who, was in Uganda as a soldier, was in Rwanda as a soldier, was in Congo as a soldier, and he has committed crimes all across. So the rapprochement of Felix has been really shocking to us. Um, and he, he's, he's not just Rwanda that he's uh, been uh, close to, he's gotten close to Morocco, for example. The president of the Congo declared that he supports Morocco in control of uh, Western Sahara saying that Western Sahara not being part of Morocco is a form of balkanization of uh, Morocco. For anyone who knows the struggle of Western Sahara, this is a national liberation movement where the people of Western Sahara are colonized by Morocco and they want their freedom. So no one can be confused about that. The African Union as an institution is clear about Western Sahara because the African Union recognizes uh, the Western Sahara. 
Sadly, the Congolese president today is the president, is the chairman of the African Union. So the African Union has a chairman that recognizes Morocco's control and colonization of Western Sahara. So beside the Western Sahara situation, we have the Palestinian question. The president of the Congo went to speak at APAC conference and in the APAC conference stated that the Congo is going to open a diplomatic mission in Jerusalem, pretty much certifying the uh, looting of the no, looting of the land, the taking off the land from the Palestinians. They are being ripped off of being dispossessed of their own land. So as Congolese with the suffering that we've had, we are surprised that the Congolese president is opening uh, a diplomatic mission in Jerusalem saying that this is a branch of the Congolese embassy in Israel. So this is happening in the backdrop of the 2018 elections. In, in 2018, there was a presidential election. This presidential election would not have happened if the Congolese people did not fight for it. And this is the backdrop of explaining why Pres, uh, President Felix is head a, uh, the leader of the DRC today. Because people will say, oh, there is a president in the, in the DRC, there is a government, why can they address this issue? But this 2018 election was a rigged election. Felix cut a secret deal with the former president of the Congo, Joseph Kabila. The secret deal was signed in front of Kenya, Egypt, and also South Africa, a representative of these countries as documented in Jeune Afrique, Africa Confidentials, and many um, other newspapers that we know today there is a secret deal. And this secret deal stipulated that the president of the DRC will not go after the former president for economic crimes and all the crimes that he committed, be, uh, beside all the things that he may have promised. Now, as an unlikely winner of the election, he lacks legitimacy with the people of the Congo because people of the Congo did not vote for him, right? He, we were announced on, uh, in January 2019 that he was the winner of the election and he's been ruling pretty much with the US ambassador as I as, uh, usually say, as his personal assistant, that anywhere Felix Shisekedi travels is mo mostly he's with the US ambassador. So it's clearly, it's clear to me that the US is almost remote controlling our president, telling him what to do and how to move. The US uh, made a statement around Morocco and Western Sahara, saying that Western Sahara belongs to Morocco, you know, implying that, uh, such as such, the Congo does the same. The US opens an embassy in Jerusalem, Congo does the same. And then lately we have now the presence of the US military. Now with this rigged election, uh, with him being in power and lacking legitimacy and being uh, getting closer to run than others, it's hard for him to hold any neighbors accountable if they are committing crimes in the DRC. And that's very important to know. In December of 2020, December 23rd, the UN Group of Experts published a report. They usually publish two reports a year. So the, the report that came out in December documented that in the Nyirangongo, Masisi, and Ruchuru territory, that's in North Kivu, that's it, in the area where they killed the ambassador. They clearly stated in this report that the Rwandan military, the Rwandan Defense Force, had the soldiers clandestinely, illegally, on Congolese soil, doing military operation, which is against the sanction, sanction regime of the 1533 resolution of the United Nations that created a sanction regime for DRC. That the, the Rwandan soldiers cannot be in DRC with our proper information and documentation that they are there. So we know random soldiers are in the DRC illegally, clandestinely where they killed the ambassador. We also know where they killed the ambassador. Uh, there is a Congolese military base. How do we know that? There is a video, uh, four videos circulating now online 
of uh, the moments right after the kidnapping. In this video, you can see three antennas. The locals call this area the uh, zone, zone de trois antennes, meaning uh, the area of three antennas. These are cell towers, right? The, this area, for anyone who knows the region, everyone will tell you there is a Congolese military base right beside there. And according to the UN uh, report, there is also the Rwanda military. So they killed the diplomat, the head of uh, diplomacy of Italy in the area where the Congolese government and the Rwandan government have information. Will the United Nations be able to really help in getting the truth? My fear is they may not. If Zaida Catalan and Michael Schrock, the two UN group of experts who were killed uh, a couple of years ago, and till today there is no due justice. If the United Nations, the Congolese government, and other international bodies did not solve this case of Zaida Catalan and Michael Schrock due to the lack of political will, I doubt they will do the same for this killing. And it's really important uh, to know the case of the two UN group of experts who were killed. Because according to foreign policy, during the investigation and after the closing of the investigation, the United Nations suppressed evidence implicating the Congolese government into the killing of two UN group of experts. This is what foreign policy is saying. So if the United Nations can suppress that, and they've done so in the past when Dag Hammarskjöld, the first UN Secretary General was killed uh, while he was traveling to other Congo, that was suppressed 60 years ago. And we have this now, the only way justice can take place is for people to demand it and not wait for these institutions. And for the Congo, as this crime take place, our call is very clear. For the past two decades, over 6 million Congolese people have died. In 2010, a, a report was published called the UN Mapping Exercise Report. In that report, it called for the creation of an international tribunal for DRC. The Congolese people support this process. The reason why they support this process is because beyond the Congolese who committed the crimes in DRC, others who committed the crimes are not in DRC. And we have to have international jurisdiction and international mechanism to try them. So Congolese are saying to stop the killing of people like uh, Luca Tanazio, Vittorio Lacovacci, or Mustafa Milambo, we must end the culture of impunity with the creation of the International Tribunal for Congo per the recommendation of the UN Mapping Exercise Report, per the advocacy of the Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. Denis Mukwege, and per the voice of the millions of Congolese who continue to scream for justice for the millions who have died in the DRC since 1996.